Amen. Would you turn with me please to Deuteronomy this morning? Deuteronomy 30. Again, if you didn't bring a Bible, raise your hand real high. The ushers have Bibles. And if you're watching by internet, uh, get your Bible and uh, you can wait till after service to eat and these other things and <clears throat> give the Lord your full attention and His Word and you'll, you'll get more out of it. Didn't the Bible say, take heed how you hear? For with the measure you meet, that's how it'll be measured to you. If you, if you don't half pay attention, that's what you'll get out of it. Not, not half much. <laughs> But if you give the Lord your full attention and show respect and give Him your faith, you get more and more. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, and the 11th verse, and we'll read this out of the Good News translation. Before we do, I want us to agree in prayer for the rest of the service. Father, we agree together as touching and asking you for this revelation anointing, the manifestation of your presence, your spirit, utterance, precise, exact, and powerful. Your words speaking into our life, your plan revealed to us, your ways and your person made clear and known to us. Give, ever, give all of us eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that understand, I pray. And we purpose not to be forgetful hearers, but by your grace to be doers of what you show us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Deuteronomy 30 and 11. The Lord says here, The command that I'm giving to you today is not difficult or beyond your reach. It's not up in the sky. You don't have to ask who will go up and bring, bring it down for us that we may hear it and, and obey it. It's not on the other side of the ocean. You don't have to ask who will cross the ocean and bring it to us. That we may hear it and obey it. No, it's here with you. You know it and can quote it. So now obey it. <laughs> it's here. You know it. You can quote it. So what? Obey it. Do it. Obey it. It's not just knowing something that, that makes a difference in your life. It's only what you do. And uh, keep going. Verse 15. He said, today I am giving you a choice. Between good and evil, between life and death. Keep reading for a few, a few verses here. If, everybody say if. Yeah. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I give you today, if you love him and obey him and keep all his laws, then you will prosper and become a nation of many people. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're about to occupy. Keep going. But if you disobey. Now this language you will see over and over again. Old Testament, law, prophets, New Testament, epistles. You'll see this idea over and over again. If you do this, this is going to happen. If you don't, you do something else, then something else is going to happen. Everybody say if. if. But if you disobey and refuse to listen and are led away to worship other gods, what's going to happen? You'll be destroyed. I warn you here and now, you will not live long in that land across the Jordan that you're about to occupy. Keep reading. I'm now giving you the choice. Who has the choice? Is it God's choice? No. It's man's choice. I'm now giving you the choice between life and death, between God's blessing and God's curse. And I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. He said, I'm saying this and I'm calling he heaven and earth to, to recognize and know that the choice is yours. I gave you the choice. And if in time to come you don't like what you got, you can't blame me. I gave you the choice. Everybody in heaven heard it. Everybody on the earth heard it. Hmm? In time to come, if somebody's complaining, why, why did this happen to me? Or why didn't that happen to me? And you can fuss all you want. But at the end of life, he'll look around and everybody will say, 
He gave you the choice. <laughs> and in light of that, why are so many millions of Christians trying to say it's God's choice? It's up to God. All up to Him. I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. And then He even tells you which one to pick. Right? <laughs> Choose life, not, not death. Now, now sometimes people say, well, I didn't choose this. Yeah, mo more than you know. Because if they say, well, I didn't choose this life being cut short and, and this curse and all this stuff. Did you choose not to obey him? Because if you did, you chose death. Are y'all with me, friends? If you want life, you have to choose to obey. You have to choose to do it his way. He said, the choice is yours. Now, we got into this a few weeks ago, and I want to go further into it. There are beliefs that are held as sacred among millions in the church world. And there are preachers and, and churchgoers that are very adamant about things like God is sovereign. And most folks don't even know what they mean when they, when they say that. What does that mean? God is in control. Really? Of what? Everything. Really? You? God is in complete control of you? <laughs> Let's just start with yesterday. Are we going to say that everywhere you went, everything you did, everything you said, everything you ate, everything you bought was the predetermined perfect will of God all day and all night? Because God's in control. <laughs> hmm? I've had people get, get upset with me about talking about some of these things. I had a guy come down after the ser service one time. and he, I mean, he had fire in his eyes. He said, I want you to know God is sovereign. <laughs> and, and, and if he wants you to do something, then by God, you're going to do it. He's almost cussing. <laughs> that can tell you somewhere, you know, that can tell you something about where this is coming from. Yeah. See, you, you're going to do it. God wants you to do it. You're going to do it, little man. <laughs> Brother Hagen said, uh, my, Kenneth Hagen, my father in the faith, said years ago he was preaching along some of these lines. And, and, uh, and a guy just jumped up in the crowd. And, and, and he said, uh, he said, I don't believe it. God is almighty. God is sovereign. And if he wants you to do something, then you're going to do it. And he said, without even thinking, it just came. he didn't know the man. It just came right out of his mouth. He said, well, why don't he make you pay your tithes then? <laughs> he said, the guy, the guy was standing up. He said, Israel, he just dunked down behind, behind the seat like that. <laughs> See, he wanted to get mouthy. And God just told off on him. In front of people. <laughs> Brother Hagin said, I'm put his hand on his mouth. I thought, where'd that come from? <laughs> no, God's not making you do what he wants you to do. If he was going to make anybody do anything, he would make people get saved. Wouldn't he? He would make them get born again. Because that's eternity. Right? And if he's not going to make a person get saved, certainly he's not going to make people do this lesser stuff. The truth is, he gave us a choice. Did he or not? You can believe him or not. You can obey him or not. And so what we have in our life is this way 
or this way depending on the choice we made. The truth is there are all kind of things happening in this world that don't please God, that are not His will, that are not His plan, and people are going through all kind of terrible stuff because of their and their parents and their parents before them choices. Oh, but friend, there are some people that have come out, come out of some terrible stuff whose life is totally better than the people that they've known or been around and getting better all the time because they have chosen to believe him and chosen to go his way and obey him. Can you say amen? amen. Look with me at uh, two openings. Uh, Revelation, they'll put it up on the screen. Why don't you go to Ephesians 2 and we'll just put Revelation on the screen. Put Revelation 3.20 on the screen and you'd, you'd be turning to Ephesians 2, please. You said you're believing with me this morning, right? Utterance is greatly affected by the hearers. The master said this in Revelation 3.20. Behold. Hmm? I'm sovereign. <laughs> and I go where I want. When I want. No matter what you say. <laughs> huh? No. Behold what? I stand at the door and do what? Knock. Knock. If. This is big. People say, well, God, God is in control. If God is completely in control of everybody and everything, there can be no if. Come on, meditate on it. Think about it. If God's really controlling everybody and everything, there is no if. There can be no if. But he says, if any man will hear my voice, that's not just notice it, but acknowledge it, and do what? And do what? Open the door. What's going to happen? I will come in to him. And will sup with him. Hallelujah. And he with me. Yes. <laughs> you got to go back to if. What if you won't open the door? He hmm? If he doesn't come in. Then he's not in the room with you. Your room is without him. Because he is without. what you're doing and where you are. In order for him to be within, you have to ask him in. You have to open the door. And he said, if you'll do that, I'll be in. I'll be involved. I'll be with you in it. What if you don't? In Ephesians 2, notice this. Ephesians 2 and 12. Ephesians 2, 12. We'll back up to verse 11. He said, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Verse 12. That at that time you were what? You were without Christ. Now you'll notice the New Testament, I can think of four instances in the New Testament where this, uh, the people that are without is mentioned. You were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and what? Without God in the world. Everybody say without God. In the, world, in the world, and also what? Hopeless, without hope. 
Everybody say, without God, without God. is without hope. This word without God, the two words without God, represent one word in the Greek. The word atheos, which is where we get our word atheist from. Is there such a thing as an atheist? Yeah. But it's not how some think. What is an atheist? Well, some atheists, self-prescribed, would, would tell you, would assume that they are of superior intelligence to folks like you and me. Simpletons like us who need the crutch of religion. <laughs> that we're not, we're just somewhere or another not, not bright enough to see all the inconsistencies in this old patched together literary work. <laughs> and, you know, why pick this religion instead of the other plethora of religions available to believe? And so they're, they're above it, and they have pulled themselves away from our company, and they're out of the muck of this thing called religion. But it's not true. The truth is, all they've done is make themselves without God. That's what the word means. Without God. Now, what if you are without God and without hope? Then is everything that's happening in your life the plan of God? The will of God? No, actually, God is not in your life. You are without God. Are y'all with me, friends? This is a, a different mentality than many have. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew. There's some things here that can answer a lot of questions for us. Some of this you may have to chew on a bit. Hmm? How many understand if it's meat? In the word, uh, you couldn't just swallow it. You'd choke. You have to chew on it. Right? So some of these things you need to chew on. Don't just take my word for it now. Search this book. And if you think you believe something different, don't just say, well, I believe different. Where is it in the book? Discipline yourself. Make yourself find the verses. And if, if you can't find them, that should tell you something. Right? <laughs> That should be a wake-up call for you. <laughs> uh, you're going to Matthew, the 22nd chapter. And let me remind you of what we studied last time along this line. Well, we'll read this first, then, I'll, then we'll say it like that. Matthew 22 and I believe it's 14. 22, 14 says what? Many are called, but what? Few are chosen. You see this more than one time in the New Testament. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, some folks would read that or hear that and they think, well, you know, it's still up to God, whoever he chooses or not. It's his choice. But back up and read the previous verses and see how Jesus got to the statement. Verse 1. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Keep going. He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they what? They what? They would not come. You think about the king of kings. Ask you to come to something he's doing. And you say, no. <laughs> the head of the church <laughs> calls your name, invites you. And you say, mm, 
No, I'm not coming. Verse 4. He sent forth other servants and said, tell them that are bidden. He gives them another opportunity. They ignored and blew off the first invitation. He says, tell them. Look. Behold means look. I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings. Everything's ready. Come on. Come on. Verse 5. And they what? Oh, friend, this is serious. The Lord said, those that honor me, I will honor. Those that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. In the word of God, to despise something could be as simple as ignoring it. If the Lord says something, it's not to be ignored, right? If he calls you to do something, it's not something to see if you can squeeze in to your schedule. It's time to push the schedule off the desk, right? Why? Because he called. You drop everything. You change your plans. If Jesus is your Lord, that's how you operate. There's a lot of folks, Jesus is their Savior, but he's not their Lord. They won't be inconvenienced to serve him. They made light of it. They went their ways. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. Keep going. The remnant of his servants, uh, they were entreated spitefully and they killed them. Now see, the Lord is telling something that portrays what has happened from the beginning up until now. The king was wroth. Let's just stop right here. Have we seen other places where the Lord was wroth, angry with his people? If, if they're doing what it was predetermined for them to do, how can he be justified in being angry with them? When they couldn't do anything else because it was God's plan for them to do it. He was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Keep going. Then he said to the servants, the wedding is ready, and they which were bidden were not worthy. I invited them, but they weren't worthy. Keep going. So go to the highways, and as many as you can find, bid to the marriage. I want you to get the picture here now. Who's getting invited now? Somebody else. We're going to have a wedding. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have a feast. The Lord's going to have his party. <laughs> and it's going to be good. And it's going to be full of guests. And it's going to be awesome. The question is, are you going to be there? <laughs> Am I going to be there? <laughs> Bid them, come in. Verse 10. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found. These were people who had not been previously invited. Yes. <laughs> but some new, new openings had just occurred. <laughs> there was some free places at the table. Why? Because people were too busy. They were called. But because they wouldn't respond, they weren't the chosen. So all this builds up to that phrase, many are called, but few are chosen. That's what he said at the end of this whole story. So they found them good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with gifts. Everybody say, the wedding was furnished. It was furnished. When people say, God is sovereign, his will is going to be done, his plan is going to be completed, and I say, amen. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But he can do things more than one way. Are you with me, friends? And it does not have to be with the ones he first called and asked. And it, though he needs us, me or you as an individual are not irreplaceable if we decide to ignore him and rebel against him long enough. This is something I, I'm just recently understanding better. 
There's been more than one instance in the last 30 some years of, of ministry where the Lord would send me, send Phyllis and myself, the ministry, to do certain things, certain parts of the country, certain uh, parts of the body. And man, you could tell it was supernatural. It was God. And you thought, well, man, this, this is going to go like this. And it didn't. And people that said they wanted it decided they didn't want it. And things just didn't go that way. And, and weeks turned into months. And months turned into years. And then the Lord would deal with you. Do this over here in a completely different place. And you think, well, now, it bothered me at first because I said, well, Lord, I, I thought you dealt with me to do this. He did. But they didn't want it. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't receive it. And it made me scratch my head for a while. And one day while I was praying about this, I said, Lord, now you don't change your mind. You know the end from the beginning. You're not going to tell me this way. And then later on, well, no, do it this way. But he does. I said he does. There are instances of it in the scripture. Why? Because he's not going to make people receive him and do his will and plan. And many are called, but not, not everybody responds. And he brought me to this passage in Exodus. We talked about it earlier. That when the, the Lord was angry with, with his people because they had forsaken him and made these golden calves. And, and, and uh, the man of God came down off the mountain and, and he told him, he said, uh, leave me alone. Let me just read it to you. It's Exodus 32, uh, 9 or so. Exodus 32, 9. He said, I've seen this people. It's a stiff-necked people. How many know stiff-necked is bad, bad? Don't be stiff-necked. Why don't you tell your neighbor, tell them right now. I said, don't be stiff-necked. <laughs> don't, don't be. <laughs> you might know what stiff-necked is. You're getting instruction, you're getting correction, and what do you do? Hmm? <laughs> you ain't going to do it, and nobody can make you do it. No. Friend, that can mess you up so bad, the Lord himself can't help you. I know that's a giant thing to say. But I said it in a minute. Search the scriptures. Why? Because he has chosen not to force you to do something. And he said, it's your choice. Right? He said, I've seen this people. It's a stiff necked people. Keep reading. He said, now leave me alone. God's talking to Moses. Leave me alone. Let my wrath wax hot against them. And I'll consume them. I'll wipe out this whole bunch. And I will make of you a great nation. Does this mean God's plan is not going to happen? No. I'll just do it through you. Hmm? Yeah, but isn't he the one that chose the other bunch? Yeah. But he's saying, if they won't do it, I will do it through you. I was going to do it through them, but they don't want to do it. So I'll do it through you. I will make of you a great nation. And boy, Moses pled with him. He said, oh God, they're your people. You brought them out. And you know, they all died here. Our enemies will say, God couldn't get them in the land. That's why they all died. And, and he pled with him. And he said, you know, give them another opportunity, intercession. You have a beautiful yes. picture of it right here. Yes. And the Lord was merciful and gracious. But what's, what's the point? The Lord has more than one way he can do things. Right. Is his will going to be done? Absolutely. His plan, it's going to be completed. But it doesn't have to be through this person or through this church or through this ministry. Even though he called them, there are many that are called. Come on, can you see this, friend? But only few that will commit and say, yes, I will. 
And my choice is to do your will. And you got a lot of folks that are just flopping around and they're bouncing from pillar to post and they're not being used and they're dissatisfied and there's a, they're upset with God. God, why are you letting this happen to me or why aren't you doing this for me? Not humbling themselves and admitting they have made some wrong choices. And here's the results. But old friend, here's the good news. You're still breathing. God's still on the throne, right? You can make a right choice today, can't you? You can make a right choice today. And the Lord invites you and calls you. You can say, no, I don't have anything more important to do. I am your man. I'm your man. I made up my mind years ago, so a certain thing happened. And uh, the Lord dealt with, I knew of a need, financial need in a minister's life. And I prayed with him about it. And... Uh, I asked the Lord, should we, try, should we do something about that? And, and the Lord dealt with me that he was already dealing with some people about that. Well, I assume that that's the end of it. It wasn't but a few days later, the Lord dealt with me basically for us to empty our accounts and send it to them. That confused me. I thought, well, now, Lord, I thought you directed me that you were dealing with some people. He said, I, I don't mean I heard a voice, but inside me caused me to know that I was. But I have an obligation to my man here too. He needs, this is behind, and I will take care of him, whoever I have to use, and will you do it for me? And I did it, and the accounts were empty, but I felt like I was walking about that high off the ground the rest of the day. Why? Because I felt like I was one of God's go-to guys. Does anybody know what I mean by, by that? that? That if something needed to get done and it needs to get done now and not fuss and not mess around and take three weeks to decide if you're going to do it. Come on, are you listening to me, friend? How many want to be one of God's go-to guys or girls? Hmm? Well, you got to make up your mind that when he calls, you come. No matter what. Right? Amen. Won't you just say it by faith? When he calls, when he calls I, come. I come. When he sends, when he sends I, go. I go. When he directs, when he directs I, do. I do. Amen. Thank you, Lord. One of God's go to guys. Uh, look in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Whose choice is it? It's not God's choice. He made it our choice. And you can't leave up to him what he left up to you. People are trying, but it doesn't work. You, you can't do that. God has more than one way of doing things. In Hebrews 4, and the... Uh, Third verse, I want you to notice this. You know, the first generation of Israelites that were delivered out of Egyptian bondage, he told them he had selected for them the promised land. Anybody remember that? He said, I've, I've selected for you a beautiful, wonderful land. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. Did that generation enjoy that land? They did not. Can you say it was because it never was God's plan? No, it was always God's plan. It was always God's plan and they never enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 4, 3. We which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I've sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although he's talking about that, that group and what it's symbolic of. Although what? The works were finished from the foundation of the world. They didn't experience it. They didn't enter into it. Although it had been prepared. Before they were ever born. Correct. Why? Because you don't have to obey God. You don't have to make the right choice. We've been in the ministry now long enough. To see some of these. Phyllis and I have talked about it. We've had people. 
God supernaturally placed in the ministry with us, in the church with us, in situations with us, and them leave prematurely and wrongly. And a lot of times you couldn't, somebody say, why didn't you tell them? It's not the will of God. Well, if somebody comes and tells you, God told me to do this. And they didn't ask. Are you listening to me, friends? What am I going to say? <laughs> no, he didn't tell you. <laughs> I'd have to really hear from him to say anything like that. So what happened? Well, what, what we've seen in some of these cases that, is that there are holes left. And some, it can take a while for those places to be filled like they should be filled. Why? Because it's not the plan of God. They're supposed to be there doing something. And sometimes you'll see people can, can leave and get back in their place. That's the mercy of God. But then sometimes you see people will stay out of their place for years and years and the Lord has to replace them. Are you with me, friends? Now, I know that some folks don't like some of these kind of thoughts because they like to believe something else, that everything that happens is God and no matter what I do. The reason why people like this so much is it's convenient and requires nothing of us. That no matter what happens, it's not my fault. God in his infinite mercy and mysterious ways. Huh? No. Everybody's comings and goings and getting mad and walking out and quitting and starting and stopping and going through ten churches when they should have stayed at one and going through nine marriages when they should have stayed with the one. Now the Lord's merciful. He's gracious. But if you're going to keep changing things all the time, then you must understand you're not going to have the perfect will of God in your life all the time. You're going to have some stuff you shouldn't be experiencing. And it's because of the choices you made, not because of it's, it's the will of God. Or it was always supposed to be that way. There are all kinds of things happening. Well, the Lord lets you have something that never was his will. Hmm? First Samuel. Notice with me on that. Go to First Samuel. I know some of this doesn't make you want to run the aisles and shout. <laughs> but it sure can get things straight. We don't need to believe junk, do we? We don't need to believe something's true if it's not true. In 1 Samuel 8, 1 Samuel 8 verse 1, came to pass when Samuel was old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, anybody remember reading the story of Samuel and how he was born and how God spoke to him as a child? Was he God's choice? For the man of God to lead the people. Yes. No question about it. No question. Verse 2, keep reading. It talks about the name of his sons. Keep going. Verse 3. His sons didn't walk in his ways. You know, just because you grow up in a godly home doesn't mean you have to be godly. You could have, you could have some of the best input anybody's ever got and still just be a heathen and a fool. Hmm? It doesn't just work by osmosis. Why? Because you have choices to make. If you don't make the same right choices that the godly people around you made, you're not going to have the same results even though you've been around them all your life. Amen. Keep going. The elders gathered themselves and came to Samuel at Ramah. Keep going. And they said, you're old and your son's not walking your ways. Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Who came up with this new plan? The secular leaders, not the spiritual leadership. This did not come from God. Keep going. The thing displeased Samuel. You know, 
We should take heed when genuine spiritual elders are grieved and displeased with stuff. We should take heed. It should mean, it should mean something to us. Shouldn't it? Because a lot of times you're seeing a reflection of God's displeasure. Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to him, listen to them. And all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. What did the Lord say? This was my plan all along. I know you don't understand it. Uh Uh-uh. This is not his plan. He said, they have rejected me from reigning over them. They want to be like other nations. They want a king. But he let them have what they wanted, even told Samuel which one he could pick out. But it never was the will of God. Never. In fact, he warned them, if you read the rest of this chapter, he said, warn them what it's going to be like. He said, this king's going to take, 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 take. You're going to be taxed. You're going to be burdened. You're going to be charged. He's going to take your boys for his army. He's going to take your girls for his cooks. He's going to take your farmlands. He's going to take your crops. He's going to take this. And they still sit there and said, we want a king. We don't care what you say. We want a king. Did he let them have something that was completely against his will and against his plan? He did. He did. He did. Should this be an eye opener to us? You know, in the beginning days of walking with the Lord, learning about faith, there are a couple of things that I, I was persistent with him about I wanted and I wanted to do. And he let me do it. And after about three of those, I put my nose in the carpet and said, oh God, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to let me <laughs> do stuff anymore. <laughs> Forgive me. What do you want? What is your will? What is your plan? You know, uh, Brother John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, made this statement many years ago. Brother John Wesley. He said, It seems God is limited by our prayer life. That he can do nothing for humanity unless someone asks him to. Is it true? Is that true? James 4, 2. Put it up on the screen for us. James 4, 2. The last part of it says, you have not. Why? Because God in his sovereignty saw fit for you not to have it. And if it was never in the plan of God for you to have it, then you were never going to have it, no matter what you did or didn't do, because God is sovereign and in control. Really? You have not why? You have not why? Because you didn't ask. You mean there can be something that God wants you to have? Is his will for you to have? Wants to do in your life? But... It won't happen because you didn't ask. Is it true that God is completely in control of everybody and everything? Friend, let's take the religious colored glasses off of our eyes. Look around in the world. What's happening in our cities in our country, in other countries, there is terrible destruction, innocence being destroyed. People starving to death for lack of a decent meal, genocide, people coming into people's villages and just wiping them out, just killing them, murdering them in mass, robbing and stealing. You're going to tell me? That was God's plan? You're going to tell me God some mysterious way? His will is being accomplished in that? Is it true 
that God is governing and controlling everything down here? Or is this true? That people that have rejected him are without him. And he is not in it. Come on, are you listening to me, friends? And if you don't open the door and you don't invite him in, he's not in there. Come on, are y'all listening, saints? Is this revelation? He's not in there. Wouldn't that explain a lot of the junk that's happening that God's not even in it? He's not in it. He's not around it. Is it true instead of saying that God is in and controlling everything, would it be true according to the scriptures we're reading today that unless you ask him to, unless somebody asks him to and believes him to, he's not in it. He's not involved. Don't take my word for it. Meditate upon it. Search the scriptures. If you think you believe something different, it's not okay to say, well, I I disagree. Where is what you believe in this book? Where is it? And it's not just a half a verse. It has to agree with all the other verses. How many can see how there could be confusion, but, but you can get clarity. If people say, well, God's will is going to be done. His plan is going to be fulfilled. And we say what? Amen. It is. Right? But then they go too far and say that everybody has to do his plan and will, and they don't. I said they don't. He can do it other ways. He can use other people. Go to Luke, please. Have you got just a couple more minutes here? He said, the, before we got saved, we were without Christ, we had no hope, and we were without God in the world. Are there people like that today, that they are without God? Would he come into their life and get involved if they would ask him? He would. Does he want to? He does. But he's not going to, unless they ask him. They are without him in this world. That's, that, that, doesn't that make more sense to you as you look at the, the, the tragedy and the junk that's going on in the world than to try to say that some way or another God's behind all that? People say, well, I just believe there's a reason for everything. Well, okay. But don't mean the reason has to be it's the will of God. It can be because somebody made a wrong choice. I'm convinced that in time to come and things come out, it's going to be so plain and clear. The sad thing is that children pay for the choices of their parents. Did you hear me? And some, some countries, you've got people generations ago who knew God, who knew better and rejected him. And now you've got generations that have grown up completely godless and without God. But how many believe that no matter how far away people have got, if somebody in the midst of the deepest darkness will raise a hand and say, Lord, I want you in my life. I want, I'm asking you, get in my business, (laughs) get involved with me. Will he do it? He said, I will come in. Didn't he say it? I will come in and I won't just come in. I'll come in and sit down at the table with you and eat with you and fellowship with you. And I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I'll never let you down. Hallelujah. How many believe that we ought to be asking him and looking to him saying, Lord, how can we get you more involved in our business, in the church? See, the truth is, the truth is, there are a lot of sermons God's not even in. There's a lot of praise songs God's not even in. 
There's a lot of church stuff, a lot of church services. God's not in it. He's not in it. You know, I, I caught myself the other night. I was seeing something that had to do with some church things and some ministry activity somewhere else. And, and I caught myself. I said, Lord, what do you think about that? You like that? Is that what you like? Concerning myself, I'm asking all the time. I'm examining, I'm looking. It's easy to be religious. It's easy to just do something because somebody else did it. It's been passed down from generation to generation or somebody in your church group or denomination or whatever. No, no. Where did that just be? Somebody 400 years ago could have had a goofy idea. Right? And God's never been in it for 400 years. So why do you want to keep perpetuating it? But how many believe we can be sure if this book says it's his will and it pleases him and is good in his eyes, you know that. Yes. So that's where you keep coming back to. And we keep checking, his Holy Spirit's in us. And we should keep asking and checking with him. Let's watch about these mindless phrases. God's in control. Well, there must be a reason. God has a purpose in everything. Really? Where's that at? Amen. In the scripture. That's right. Well, everything's working out for good. That's, like the, that's half a verse. Yes. It's working out for good for a specific group of people who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Everything is not working out good for everybody. No. Well, it'll all work out good in the end. No, it won't. It's going to work out real bad for a lot of folks. <laughs> but for them that love the Lord, that ask Him and believe Him to be in their life, He can take even what the enemy meant for evil. He can take even some of our dumb mistakes and turn it around so it works out for our good and His glory. If you ask him to. And if you believe him to. Anybody believe that in here? Stand up on your feet everybody. We'll save Luke for another time. <laughs> thanks be unto God. Oh somebody say thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. Close your eyes and let me lead you in a prayer. Everybody said out loud if, if you mean it from your heart. Father God, I believe in you. Not just that you exist, but that you are a good God. All the tragedy, all the pain in the earth is not your doing. It is not your will. You're a good God. Lord, I believe, just like the scripture said, there are many that are without you and no hope in this world. That's not me. That's not us. There are many that won't let you in. Not me. I'm asking you. Come into my life. In full measure. Every part. Every area. Everything. That's not of you. That's not right. That doesn't please you. Help me to see it. Grace me to change it. And show me how to invite you and allow you full motion, full flowing, full working in me, through me, to your glory in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, let's lift up our hands and thank him and praise him.